Hello everyone. Um, apologies for the delay. It was just a technical uh, things we were dealing with to set up the live stream. Um, so thank you uh, for coming and thank you for organizing uh, our event onwards. Uh, part of the LEED uh, Digital Festival. Um, I am Karoli Hassan Ali. I'm uh, an innovation consultant um, and I'm part of the GA team uh, that is hosting the, the event in collaboration with Brantwood. Um, so I will just give a quick introduction to the event uh, in which we will try to provide expert advice on uh, funding growth for uh, tech startups. Um, just a quick note on social distancing measures. Um, um, speakers won't be wearing masks, but we, we required negative COVID tests from everyone. So, um, so just uh, let's have a quick look on this graph, um, on which we can see an overview of the um, funding streams that startups can access. Uh, so from the beginning, the personal funds, uh, so founders' funds, friends and family, and essentially to the last stage where the company becomes a public company. Um, so for each funding streams, uh, we can match uh, development stage of the startup, so from the initial stage, the concept, the concept stage, uh, to uh, the last stage, the scale-up stage. So for the purpose of this event, uh, we will focus on one specific area, the development, pre-commercial and early commercialization stage. Um, we will talk about uh, business angel and venture capital funding, uh, innovation loans, and we will have a mention as well of grants, which come a bit earlier in the, in the development stage of the startup. So to talk about this topic, we will have uh, Helen Oldman, Helen Oldman, Oldham, sorry, from North Invest, North in, from North Invest uh, talking about angel investment. Uh, we will have Sarah Hex from Mercia Technologies uh, who will give us some insight about venture capital funding. Um, we will have Alex Beardsley um, from ADL uh, who will give us a presentation about loans and alternative funding. Uh, then we will have Dr. Vivian Badeau from uh, DRIAD, who will talk about uh, research and development grants. Uh, Paula Denison from Adventure, uh, who will give a presentation on startup support and local grants. And finally, James Wright, Simon Palmer from Garbutt and Elliott, who will talk about R&D tax credit and uh, investment scheme uh, laid out by the government. Uh, finally, you can follow our uh, event online uh, with the live stream link that has been provided. And uh, don't hesitate mentioning the event online with the hashtag onwards uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, so I will just uh, let uh, Dr. Vivian Bado start the presentation um, on uh, Triad. for attending. So I'm uh, the uh, founder and managing di director of uh, RIAD. Uh, so I will start by a quick introduction of the, the company. So uh, we are in an innovation in Annapolis. Uh, we are an international consultancy uh, and we offer bespoke uh, support to uh, startups and scale-ups to bring their ideas to life. And the core of our expertise is uh, research and development uh, grant funding. So uh, we are funded in 2014 and uh, we have supported uh, over 170 uh, innovative companies over the years and have them raising over 62 million pounds and our success rate for, for grant funding is uh, currently set at about 75% overall. So today, uh, I will be speaking about uh, innovation and research and development grants. Uh, so it's a subset of grant funding. Um, so grant funding, generally, uh, generally speaking, is uh, non-dilutive public funding, uh, which means that to access to this funding, you uh, don't need to uh, give any securities, uh, you don't need to give any equity. Uh, but uh, it comes with uh, a lot of other sites, uh, as you will see uh, later. 
uh, research and development grants are uh, financing uh, a portion, uh, usually a portion, of the costs of uh, an innovation project. Um, and it emphasis on a project if it's not structured to fund uh, a company's normal activities. Um, and the last element uh, is the amount of, of grants, which is uh, typically uh, between uh, 50,000 uh, pounds and goes up to 2 million pounds and above, at least for uh, when research and development grants are, are concerned. Um, why are uh, research and development grants useful to grow? So they, they are set up uh, with the idea of bridging uh, a market gap in uh, the finance, uh, the financial market. Um, they are aimed at supporting projects that are deemed too risky for venture capital, um, but also uh, for companies that um, are pre-revenues and have no securities. Um, so um, it is a type of funding that uh, can be accessed fairly early on if the project is considered or can be considered as beneficial not only to the company but also to society at large, uh, the country, taxpayers, the industry. And as it's public money, uh, obviously that the reason for funding a private venture uh, with public money is that it is beneficial to society, so it's a key element. Um, mostly, grant, research and development grants will fund uh, intangible assets, so um, they are, um, there's not that many uh, targeted funding that uh, will be able to fund for salaries, so most of the uh, the cost of research and development grants are usually covering uh, labor costs. Um, typically, about 60% of the grant will be for labor costs. But also subcontracting within limits, uh, so depending on the fund, uh, that can uh, the that can uh, be limited in terms of uh, where the subcontractors are from. Uh, with Innovate UK, for example, uh, you need your subcontractors to be uh, a UK company. Um, and you cannot usually subcontract uh, the research and development phase. Uh, you can also fund uh, some uh, piece of equipment and IP uh, with, uh, with research and development grants. Um, and it is also useful for startups uh, because uh, it helps them, or I should say, forces them to structure. Um, because uh, a grant can also be a huge pressure for uh, cash flow. Uh, most of the time, uh, funding is um, is available in areas, uh, which means that a company of with a company that has uh, a small size uh, might struggle a bit to fund uh, the, the beginning of the project uh, and to match fund uh, the project. Uh, but um, with that funding, that helps uh, dealing with uh, the ongoing cost of research and development. Um, there's also a pressure on processes uh, because you have to put on time sheets to manage. Uh, to track and manage uh, the time spent by the team, uh, but it forces you also to do risk analysis and a lot of reporting, uh, whose amount varies depending on the providers. Um, so what you need to know about research and development grants, uh, with regards to the application process, most of the time uh, it is uh, a, writing, a written application, uh, can be templated or, uh, on an online portal, uh, and the, the size of uh, the application can go anywhere between 10 and 50 plus pages long, so it can be quite an undertaking. Uh, more, nowadays, uh, there's more and more uh, requests for a pitch or video pitch uh, as part of the application process. And we are seeing a move towards also a two-step process when there's an expression of interest followed by a full application. 
uh, for example, the European Commission recently moved towards this, um, which is uh, has its uh, advantages in the sense that uh, you don't need to commit immediately to prepare the 50 pages in the application. <laughs> but that's an extra piece of work and it delays the, the whole process. And um, all most uh, Almost all research and grant funding come with a deadline for application, which puts obviously an extra pressure on you, uh, especially when the notice period uh, between the announcement of the competition and uh, the deadline is uh, short. Uh, the selection process, uh, once you have submitted an application, is typically uh, done by uh, external reviewers, uh, so three to five independent assessors uh, will review the application and all the content you have submitted. And then uh, most of the time, again, based on score sheets, uh, they will rank uh, all the applications from the best to the worst and fund from top to bottom until there's no funding available. There's also sometimes a portfolio approach typically typically with Innovate UK, where they try to fund, um, um, uh, to fund across the board different type of uh, technology projects and not focusing too much on one specific. So for example, uh, with open competitions, there are often a lot of applicants with digital technology, uh, and they will uh, underfund the digital technology to be able to fund some biotech, some space technology, some advanced manufacturing, typically. So that means that if you are in digital technology, your chances of success are actually a bit lower. Um, typical timings to remember when you are applying for a grant. First, the drafting. Um, depending on uh, the complexity of uh, the grant, uh, you are looking at anywhere between two weeks and two months to prepare an application. and it is full time and it's often senior management uh, level time. So it can be quite uh, a strain on resources for small companies. Then there is the time to fund once you have uh, submitted the application. There's the review process, there's due diligence, there's a lot of paperwork, generally speaking, to uh, deal with. Um, before you can effectively access the cash. And a lot of the grants are refunded in arrears, which means that you have to up from the cost. Uh, and so this can be a huge pressure on cash flow, hence what I was emphasizing uh, in uh, the previous slides. Um, and then you go into effectively um, doing the project you receive funding for. Um, typically, projects uh, will last between 6 and 24 months. It can be shorter, it can be longer, but that's the average. Um, and uh, with the grant, you usually have uh, a very um, determined and very fixed uh, calendar for that. So you have a starting date. If you start the project and you start spending before the starting date, that won't do. And uh, if you are spending much quicker than what you have announced at the beginning, you will have a problem with the funders as well. So um, some providers, to give an example uh, of what you can expect. So uh, you have uh, providers go from local, national to international. Um, for the local, uh, so I, I uh, put as an example the uh, uh, local enterprise partnership network. Uh, which uh, have uh, branches in every region in the UK. Um, so typically, the, the, the size of the project you're looking at are around 25k for six months duration, and success rates will be on average between 10 and 20 percent, and you're looking at a, a rather condensed application. Uh, so we'll have a very good example, some details of that, uh, with the presentation of Adventure uh, later today. Um, national funding, so I spoke about Innovate UK, there are others provide, other providers. Um, you're looking at projects that are on average uh, 200, 250,000 pounds uh, in so 
for which you will receive a grant of 200, 250,000 pounds for a, a duration of a year. Uh, success rates are 10% or below. Um, for open competition at the moment with Innovate UK, uh, success rates are at 5%. So it starts to be really difficult. Uh, typical uh, size of the application, uh, 20 pages long plus a video pitch plus some appendixes. And then you have international funding from the likes of uh, so Horizon Europe, so it's the European Innovation Council here. Um, that is still accessible to uh, British entrepreneurs at this point in time. Uh, and you are looking at a, a very uh, big pot of money, uh, up to 2.5 million pounds uh, for two years. It's not that often that you can get that much money for research and development. Uh, but it comes with uh, an extremely heavy um, application. Uh, so it's a three-stage process. Uh, overall, it is uh, more than 50 pages long. Uh, and the success rate at the end is uh, 2%. Uh, so um, it is for companies that are really disruptive and that are very confident about, <laughs> about that element. <laughs> Right, um, so to wrap up, uh, grant funding uh, is really, really, uh, and I cannot emphasize it uh, strongly enough, uh, useful for funding research and development projects. There's not that many options uh, on the market, but it is uh, difficult to access for startups. Um, and it has to come uh, as a part of an overall funding strategy due, due notably to uh, the, the, the complexity of the processes, uh, the pressure on cash flow, and uh, also uh, the success rate that can be fairly low as, you, as you've seen. Um, due to the timeline uh, that I mentioned, uh, where the time to grant can be anywhere between three for the small funding to nine months for the large ones, uh, you have to start the process early, a long time before you need the cash, <laughs> obviously. Um, and it's often a struggle for early stage entrepreneurs that um, are living uh, in the next three months uh, of the company, especially when it comes with uh, the research and development strategy. Uh, a lot of agile companies especially struggle with that. Um, but, so, um, the, the, the best strategy, generally speaking, for accessing to this kind of, of grant funding is to uh, be very ambitious and fund the dream, what will be uh, your company ideally uh, once you have put in place uh, that, that very strong project that will allow you to scale what a hundred times, typically. Um, and finally, uh, given uh, the time implication uh, and the strain that it can be on, on top management resources, uh, we advise, <laughs> a bit interested, uh, to get help. Um, for us, uh, it can be uh, a hundred hour uh, commitment uh, for work, uh, for uh, companies that uh, don't have previous experience with that, uh, it can be twice as long. Uh, and well, we know we know the process is inside out. So. Right. Um, so uh, if you are uh, if you feel you are ready or you want to explore your options, uh, please do get in touch. Um, contact you can contact me directly at my email uh, here. Uh, that will be uh, added in uh, the live stream at the moment. Um, find us on our website. We have a newsletter uh, that. Uh, presents monthly updates on, on interesting grants that are available and we have a free readiness check. And if you are uh, in Leeds, uh, do, do come to platform uh, to meet us. Uh, always happy to, to have a chat. So thank you for your, your time and attention and if you have uh, any questions, please fire away. Uh, so this is different than R&D tax credits, isn't it? Yes, yes. R&D tax credit will be covered uh, at the end of the day uh, by uh, Simon and uh, um, James. And James, thank you. <laughs> um, but um, what you need to remember about that is that um, 
R&D tax credit funds uh, elements that are similar to that of grant funding, and there can be some overlap. Uh, if you get a grant, you won't be able to fund uh, with R&D tax credit what you have funded in the grant. Uh, but uh, you uh, usually you nest within uh, uh, a grant application a lot less than what you are effectively doing in terms of research and development. And so the rest will be covered by R&D tax credit. Um, and obviously, if you are unlucky with the wrong application, <laughs> there's always research and development tax credit that, that can help you fund uh, for these elements. So when, when you, with the European grant, do you actually advise the, the whoever, whoever come, comes to you what their chances are then? Do you actually yeah. sit through it yourself and say yes, whether, what the chances are of actually getting it through? Yeah, because um, the European grants um, are so uh, involved in terms of um, drafting the content, etc., that we absolutely need uh, the, the founders' um, implication uh, to prepare the application, uh, to prepare the draft. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, they have to be very committed um, to, to make it happen. So if they don't know what the, the chances are, uh, there's not even a point of going. Because we've seen that at the beginning when uh, we didn't know in 2014, we didn't know the success rates. So we're there, okay, well, come with us, we'll help you through the process. Um, and entrepreneurs were basically letting everything in our hands, and the reviews were coming and were not very satisfactory, to say the least, because uh, we are experts in grant funding, but we are not experts in the technology of the company we are working with. So at some point, we need their, uh, we need their help and their information and their input. And the larger the grant, the more input we need from them. To the extent that European money is, is less available than it used to be for obvious reasons. Um, has the UK government stepped forward and, and provided more grant funding? Um, so, um, we are obviously at a very specific, uh, in very specific times at the moment. Um, so, last year, uh, the government really stepped up on grant funding uh, to support companies uh, during the pandemic. Um, and then, uh, at the beginning of this year, there's been a period where there was no more grants available for, I think it was before the budget was voted. Uh, so at the moment, um, I'm not really sure uh, whether the government will effectively uh, step up and, um, and make uh, more money available uh, in terms of grant funding. True Innovate UK, at this point in time, we have not seen uh, a massive uh, increase in funds available. Uh, typically, the smart competition, which is uh, an open competition accessible to all type of company with all type of projects, um, have uh, not increased their budget. Uh, and because of that, we have seen uh, a massive uh, increase of the competitiveness of, of this funding. So we are hoping that uh, there will be an increase, but we do not yet. No, no, no clear indication of that. OK, uh, well, thank you very much again. Um, and I uh, will now uh, be before. So our next speaker will be Sarah Hex from uh, Mercy Asset Management talking about uh, venture uh, funding, so uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Can't be that, can't be that difficult now. <laughs> um, great, yeah, Sarah Hex from Mercier Asset Management. Um, we are a fund management company. We have about uh, 840 million that we have under management. We cover from venture, private equity, and debt. I won't go into debt because somebody else is going to do that. And I won't go into private equity because that's a long way ahead. And really look at the venture instead. 
So we are based here in Leeds as, as one of our offices and predominantly within the north of, this, of, um, of the patch we manage the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund which is one of our venture funds. I will go into a few of the other funds as well but really it's, it's talking about venture in general but the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund does cover a lot around that, kind of, that search for venture, for venture funding. Um, as I said before, we have around 840 million, but we also, under that, have around 450 um, put in, within our portfolio of businesses. And that's a wide range of businesses, starting from the really early stage, which I know Simon's going to talk around in that EIS and seed stage, and all the way through. Um, there's a little bit more about us here. I won't go into too much detail because there's a lot of numbers on there. But one of the biggest things is on there is the ventures amount. So what, what venture can do. So that means the amount of investment that a venture fund can make. So it starts at 100,000 and it goes through to 10 million. It's quite a big span of, of funding. But what there is is that it may be that it's 100,000 at the outset, but what we always like to do is follow our money. So the reason being is, as, as we would all know, a, a new start business looking for venture funding will, also, will, be, will be there for the duration, and we want to be there for the duration of that relationship. Because to actually get its full value and to make sure that it goes through to the exit and, and reaches its full potential, it's going to need more funding along the way. And I'm sure in the last year that's been proved from any SME that the that something can hit that, that, that's unexpected. The idea for us, and one of the things that it, it does highlight on here, is that Mercia was formed to be investing in the regions and outside of the Golden Triangle, although you can't get away from having a London office, but it is the smallest office we've had, so I'm quite pleased to say that. But we predominantly work within the Midlands and the North, and as I mentioned, some of those funds are regional funds themselves, like the Northern Powerhouse or the Midlands Engine or the North East Venture Fund. And they are funds being put together and supported by British Business Bank. So British Business Bank, as we know, have been very busy this last 18 months, but actually have been around a long time investing within regions and within businesses in different guises. So, um, and we have part of that. The aim of Mercia, and I think it's actually a really good com uh, for, for any venture capital or fund management company, this, this could be mirrored, is actually looking at exactly where it is that a business will come to its exit. So in your fast growth business, where will it start and where will it go to? Um, many, many venture capital firms will say that the exit comes at seven years because that's going to reach its full potential. What we believe in a lot of venture capital is that, that that isn't the case. And actually, to get a business and stay with it all the way through is really a 15-year cycle to reach its full potential and to do that with comfort. Now, it's not always the case. 15 years isn't that you don't have to sit there waiting. But actually, it gives a good sort of view as to those first few years about where the funding sits. A lot, and what we do is use third-party funds such as British Business Bank in these early stages, and that's usually a lot what a lot of venture capital do, and then it will move on to the balance sheet. So our, our balance sheet capital is where we follow on, and that's really just where we've, we've picked through the third-party funds and gone through to the direct, um, direct investments. So what are we looking for? It's like a massive question now, isn't it? What do you look for in a business? And um, venture capital, not ju just ourselves, will always look at a product. There's no doubt that the product of what is being produced is going to be the, the biggest um, look. And, and, and most, especially now, we're looking at more tech. Something that they can really hang the hat on as a great fast growth value within venture. Um, we get a lot of proposals come to us, and as you can imagine, so much passion goes into those proposals, and we, we appreciate that, but sometimes it can just fall on the fact that there's somebody else in that space already doing it. It's far too competitive. We've had, for example, in the last 18 months, a lot of new apps for table service when you're ordering in a restaurant or in a bar. The space is full, and it has been a fantastic time for them, but actually, as it's a short-lived, it's moving away from that. We've had a lot of online education, for example, such a condensed and so difficult 
what, what we will be looking for is the one thing within that space that's going to really make a difference. Sometimes we can be pretty critical, it is just the way it has to be. But we, what we've tried to do, and what venture capital companies try to do, is bring in experts of their own. So, for example, we are investment managers, a lot of them are doctors and specialists within, within the bioscience, within um, digital space, within software, because they're actually the experts to look at, at exactly the piece of tech or, or the product. The second thing is the management team, and actually I would say it's not number two, it's, it's joint first. <laughs> it's the product and the team, because it can be the best idea and it can be the most amazing new piece of tech that's, that's just been born, but actually if it's not got the right team sat around it, it's not going to go to where it needs to go to for the growth. Now most venture capital firms, and I know for ourselves, we take a minority stake within the business and we don't insist, especially with under the Northern Powerhouse Fund, to be on the board. We'd be a spectator but would not sit on the board. But what we would look for is that that board is well shaped to take it forward through to exit. So it can be anything from the greatest piece of tech developed by the most intelligent person but not able to get it out to market. Or it could be that they're brilliant at getting it out to market, but they just need help on the tech. So it's about building those that go around that and making sure that you see the gap and, and, and go for it. So, as I mentioned before, we have a range of funds. One of them is our EIS fund, which is, goes through to that up to a million. It actually has a very small bit that's SEIS. And I know Simon's going to talk about EIS, more around the tax implications on there as well. But what we look for on, from our EIS fund is it's a national fund, so it's not just regionally specific, but it really is um, around that 100 to a million, like I say, it's that really early stage, but it would be, would be on its cusp of commercialisation. So it's not... It's not pre-revenue, it, it, it's been tried, it's been tested, and it's on its way through to revenue, revenue generating. The one I want to talk about a little bit more, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, is the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund. So as I mentioned, this fund is part of a half a billion that has been put aside by British Business Bank to invest into the Northern Powerhouse regions. That's Yorkshire, Humber, Tees, and over to Manchester as well. We manage part of that, which is Yorkshire, Hummer and the Tees, and it's the same mirrored throughout. The idea of the fund and the, the part that we manage, we have, we have a debt element to it as well, but I'll talk about the equity element, um, is that it's, it is a, a five-year fund that invests in those that are, are commercial, so it's more of a, a start-up to scale-up, just within that space that we talked about before. It starts, the tickets start at 100,000, and as it goes through to 2 million as an investment. The average that we would usually see on that fund for the age would be at least a year into sort of its formalisation and its commercialisation. About 100, um, 120 people that work for Mercia, and uh, one of the largest proportions is working on this fund in, in Leeds, it's about 40% of our people are working on this fund. So you can see it's a, it's a big part and takes a lot of investment. Now, does it just have the British Business Bank fund and that's it? We don't just invest it and go on. It's got some really good support around it as well. So one of the things that British Business Bank are very keen on is that it gets a lot of funding support, a lot of business support. It's not just here's your money and run. It's an ongoing relationship that we make sure that we, we stay close to and report on. We also have the Venture Capital Trust Fund. So this is the, an acquisition that we made a few years ago. 142 million Venture Capital Trust, and it's really going into that bigger stage. Now, one of the things that now has happened, and I have to say, I think this, it sounds like revolutionary. In the last few years, this isn't revolutionary. Not only do we co-invest between funds within Mercia, so the way I see it is if you've got a great idea and you're looking for funding, then come and talk to us and we'll decide where it fits and what, where, it can, where we can help and support. But actually, it's starting to work with a lot of other funders. We do a lot with North Invest, we co-invest with, with North Invest, where they all put in an element and we'll put it, match it or we'll come in with a, with a chunk as well. 
Um, and we do that as well across a lot of other funders, and it's starting to actually, you say it's starting, it's like, like I said, it's not revolutionary, but it's actually, it's a great way of getting that next business supported without actually having it all sat within us, within one fund. Um, and then we also have the private equity fund, which is for later stage, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a slightly different fund within that PE, PE side as well. Um, we make direct investments, like I say, on the later stage as well, so I won't go into too much of that, but it's, it, I think it really proves that a lot of venture capital is not just to see through the few, first few years. It really is a, along the journey to, to exit, and we've had some fantastic exits over the last few years um, as well. I just thought it would be good just to highlight a couple of businesses that we have invested in. It always helps me into, into, into real words, doesn't it? So this is actually over in Hull and under the Northern Powerhouse. It's a um, wellness monitoring system. So it started out as an, a, a band that was put onto people who maybe couldn't communicate how they were feeling. Um, and it would be, it was a, an interactive band that was put on the wrist of people who couldn't communicate exactly where they were or what, at any one point how they were feeling. Um, it, 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 in all fairness, it had a really tough time because there was lots coming into the market um, as well. And it, but when it first started out, it gave this real good um, description of what it's done. It's actually, its first sales were in 2019, and its growth has been fantastic because they've carried on developing. The innovation they've explored wasn't just that we've got this great wristband and it works. They could see that they've got something and they've got a market. So I think from 2019, um, it's really, really shown itself. Um, and we, act, we actually made a follow-on investment into Moobin, which was um, as well, which like I say, is quite common. We've also got Nova Pangea. This is a great business up in Tees Valley. This came under the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund. Um, clean tech business that created a revolutionary um, patented process which converts discarded blank bio, uh, plant biomass into natural biochemicals. So quite a hot spot is Tees Valley for a lot of um, regenerative kind of um, biochemicals, biofuels. So it, it was, it's been a great investment, and we see quite a lot of that activity, of that even it's just growing and growing up there for that. Um, something that, that we do do a lot of is gaming, and that seems to be pretty popular, though it's definitely popular in my house the last 18 months, <laughs> not, not by me, but by the, the, two, um, the two Xbox players. But um, soccer manager, this is a great story. We, we've actually co-invested across different funds on here, um, and something that we also saw over the last 18 months that we used the debt fund that helped as well because British Business Bank um, approved us for the Seagulls. So there's been a few of our portfolio that we're not only have we invested in over time that we've supported through the last 18 months um, just because that's, that's what's been needed. Soccer Manager um, is a, a gaming, mobile game, football um, mobile game and it's shown some great growth. It's, it, one of the other things that the investment fund does is, is really boost and, and monitor how much employment is increased. So over the last 12 months, even with the, the investments made, it's, it always has a link to it about number of new employees as well. So it, it's quite nice to see, it does make you feel warm when you see how many people that's affected. Um, and I'll just flick on to Airship as well. Airship um, is a fantastic business based down in Sheffield and um, it supports the hospitality and retail industry. It's got two sides to it. Toggle is another name that you may have heard. Um, we've just reinvested um, some funds into them as well. Uh, if you were to say that at the beginning, last, this time in March last year, when this was portfolio, a uh, client was in your portfolio, there was this, there was a, a fear because their main customers are hospitality of, ah, what's that going to look like? The reaction they made was, was phenomenal. They went straight online, they looked at solutions, they actually developed a lot of things to support their customers, knowing full well that they're in a, a tough time. Um, and it helped them to track and monetize some of their customer loyalty. They're into some really nice big brands as well, um, really hot on social media. Uh, you know, Dan Brookman, who's the um, CEO, is brilliant. He just, he's all over the place, but he's a, he's a good local, local guy as well, um, who seems to have just been able to develop and develop the, 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 um, that as well. Um, I will just go into this one. I didn't know I had so many, so I hope I, I don't overrun. But I think it helps to see some of the type of businesses and how small it can be in, in an industry. Um, 
So our Quella are a uh, business down in Sheffield, and another one. Uh, they developed a um, call system for care homes, so when the nurse uh, the, it, within a care home is walking around, they're able to jump on it, and they've got tracking, and they can jump onto an issue, an issue very quickly within the home. Um, it, and it's a cloud-based SaaS, so it's uh, evidence and platform and Wi-Fi enabled, so it, it meant that it was not just a phone, phone call system, it meant that their reaction could be much faster towards a patient if they needed anything. Um, that, that again is um, a spin out for spin out, I think, is our color, because I, I think the guy who, who had it was serial entrepreneur. But I also think it's, it's worth saying that some of our CEOs and some of the leadership teams that we have, it can be a repeat entrepreneur. It hasn't always started and been the one idea that, that, that's developed and been funded. It's actually a series, and it's just that they've, they've carried on going when the when the venture capital or funder says no, they've carried on with the next idea or developed it. And also, I think they've been open-minded enough to take feedback from people. And I think that's another thing that we really like to see is that it isn't just, this is my idea and this is what I'm going for. It's that sort of two-way discussion of, it's not the way that we would do it or have you thought about it um, as well. I'll flick on to, to Hero. Hero are a local firm here in Leeds. Many of you may know them, actually, if I say Hero Wellbeing. They were based in platform. I think they've just moved out. Um, they were our friends during lockdown. We did many a webinar around different types of wellbeing, but they um, are a, a great sort of uh, wellbeing platform. They go into corporates um, and support them on um, developing wellbeing and health. So they've got a range of their own sort of nutritionists and experts in house physiotherapists who will build a platform and go into a corporate or into an SME and talk about um, how they can support their people um, with this with the app. They um, have got a good list of clients and I think it says on there as well. One thing I really like about Hero is they have carried on and on and done exactly what we just talked about around adapted their business so they've adapted to what was in front of them and like I said the last 18 months that's been pretty pretty impressive from them because they've gone mainly online. So that's um, it on the on the presentation um, but I will go to questions if anybody has anything. Yeah. Oh, there's one. So um, at, what sh at what stage should a business start speaking to investors? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I think the earlier the better. It, 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 it goes without saying that most of us like to get in there early and I think that the earlier on how we can help shape the deal helps as well. If some, I, I noticed before when Vivienne was talking that you talked about the pitch and putting a pitch together. Um, I, I have to say when we look at pitches, you know, some of the main parts of it are just tell us the product um, and we can decide from that point if it's something worth us discussing more with. Um, and that doesn't mean that the pitch is, you know, the 20 pages of a pitch doesn't, it gets ignored. But the bit that we will home in on is what do you think the value is going to be and what is the product and who are the management team? And that's actually usually about three or four pages. So I think the earlier the better with a summary of what the product is and what the team is could make a real difference towards us being able to help shape the deal. I also think as well, Vivian said it as well, it's part of the deal, it's not just come to us and we'll give you funds, actually some sort of like look at, we've been here and we've talked to North Invest or we've been to the left and we've been on the investment readiness programme, you know, some of that kind of background work could really make a difference, but I, I do think keeping in touch at the early stage is, is really important as well. So to, to what extent can you help a management team? So for example, if they've got a great product, a great idea, but you think they're a bit light in some of the, um, in the managerial area, the leadership area, and obviously you've got a, lot, a large network, can you help the, the team in that respect? Yeah, yeah, we, we have an in-house talent coordinator who manages our non-exec um, sort of relationships. So we would suggest if a non-exec was to go in, or, or even a, a, a CFO, FD sort of range, same with CTO as well, if there was a gap that was needed, 
we would use her to come in and talk to them about exactly what GAP it is and where we've got it. So we've got quite a nice um, spread of non-exec and senior management. I think as well, the universities are, are really good at, at supporting that. Um, I think there's been some good interactions and connections made with them around maybe slotting in somebody that you might need, whether it, usually more that would be around like your, your CTO or some sort of technical yeah. support. But yeah, that's where we go. And, and we do we do spectate and, on board as well. And some of our investment directors and the exec team are, 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 are themselves um, on the board of the crew, but usually by invitation. Thank you. One thing I was just going to mention, I didn't mention it before, the lead time we mentioned about sort of when to come when to come to us, just to give loads of time, because it can take quite a long time. I looked the other week, it's like 100 days from start to finish for investment. We don't want it to be 100 days, but you know, let's be realistic, it, it, it easily could be. So I think, you know, coming for investment, give, give yourself a good lead time to have discussions, but also be prepared, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be in a couple of months, it's gonna be three to four months before it's actually you know, I've seen them take longer just to, just to say it. <laughs> Obviously not for us. <laughs> is that quite common, Sarah? Because I think we see a lot of that, that, that unpreparedness just in terms of the time scale. So I'm quite pleased that Vivian mentioned that as well. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think you know, fair enough. You've got a great idea. You want to get it out to market. You, 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 don't, you, want, you want to, don't want to miss the boat. I had somebody the other day and they said, I just want to get it out. It's like... I know but there's a lot of hoops and there's a lot of time and there's, you know, I know you, that, and that passion is amazing and what you don't want to do is squash that passion. Yeah. So there is a, there's a fine line between the time span, but yeah, I, I, you know, whether we like it or not, I think, you know, we've got, we've got to be realistic that, you know, put your pitch together, put your time in, but start talking early and actually just be prepared that it's going to take a few months to come to fruition. And I suppose being prepared and investor ready in terms of the pitch is going to move that time scale along if you have considered all those Yeah, aspects. yeah. And I think take that feedback as well. I know yeah. that Gab and Nelly are working hard on the investment readiness program, but it's like building in the feedback to to actually take that feedback and, and start adapting it a little bit as well. Yeah, definitely. In terms of uh, University of Leeds, because it's a massive organisation, who's your entry point in, term, in terms of that kind of health business? Well, I mean, it's a range. Our investment managers are pretty close to, to each university. So we used to have a, a university specialist, but we, used, we have quite a range of... of Spark, for example, yes. that we're close to um, as well. Um, and I know that uh, Will Schaefer, he spends a bit of time at Nexus quite regularly just to, to, um, to keep close. It, it's, it's difficult because it, it, it's thinly spread and, and you know, there's a lot of universities within the north. Right. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, we, we do try to make sure we, we keep at least the doors open to make sure we can get people into us. Are you still doing those, those Friday morning meetups? For yeah, startups? yeah, that's been really enlightening. It's like we started them a year ago, so we opened the doors for what we call Meet the Funder on a on a Friday morning, and it basically you can book online time to spend with one of our investment <laughs> managers and be at any stage within your funding journey. And um, it can be from you know I've just had a great idea, can we talk about it? To actually. I've been established for 20 years and would like to look at some funding. Um, and it's worked really well. It's a 20 minute chat and, um, and it can be from anywhere. And it, it's amazing how we fill that every week. Um, and our guys love it. They, they really enjoy it. They really, really enjoy that sort of having a chat to people in that format. So it's good. Great. Well, if there's no more questions, I shall hand back over. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. So our next speaker will be Paula Denison from Adventure. Um, she'll be presenting a more local approach, so startup support and uh, local funding. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you go? Thank you. Um, thanks very much for inviting me here this morning, and hello to our online watchers. I hope we've got a few on there. 
Um, I'm Paula Dennison, I'm the Business Grants Manager for the Adventure Growth Grants. I'm relatively new in post. This is my first time out, so bear with me <laughs> if I struggle a little bit with some of this. Um, the Adventure Program, by the left. Uh, it's fully funded by ERDF and partners and we provide one-to-one -one support uh, from business advisors to develop growth plans. Um, we have funding for growth which is a 50% grant support fund um, with a maximum grant of 25,000 match so the total project value, value is about 50. Um, we have a workshop and events program and we also uh, have delivery partners with the local universities who offer facilitated peer-to-peer -peer networks, <coughs> academic expertise, and a hothouse program called Accelerate, which is proving very popular, and it's actually currently recruiting at the moment. So if we have anybody interested in looking up the Accelerate program, um, there is information on our website about that. Um, and then there's sector-specific advice and support. Um, in order to uh, get onto the Adventure Programme, there's some eligibility requirements because of the way that the funding has been put together. Um, and uh, you need to be a small to medium enterprise that's less than three years old, uh, based within the mid city region, and trading primarily with other businesses, so B2B model rather than B2C, and committed and planning to achieve growth in turnover and the creation of jobs, and, and that job creation is linked to the grant value. So that there, is, there are a couple of hoops there. And also, because of that European element, then we have eligible sectors for trading and ineligible sectors for trading. And the ineligible sectors are agriculture, banking and finance, nuclear decommissioning, if we've got anybody concerned <laughs> about that. Um, I'm here today with my colleagues, Daniil, the marketing manager, and Stuart, program head. So if anybody wants to chat about any of this afterwards, uh, we are fully present today. Um, so do come and have a chat afterwards um, about the, the finer detail of our eligibility and, and so on. So the growth grant overview is that the business growth grant is available to companies of less than 36 months old. It's available in amounts of 1,000 to 25,000 uh, to support capital growth costs. And there's two levels of grant. There's the step one, which is up to 5,000, and the step two of up to 25,000. Businesses are required to contribute a minimum of 50% of eligible costs and uh, to show evidence of having that match in advance of accepting an offer. Um, and the growth ambition is evidenced with a sound business plan and a cash flow forecast that will demonstrate that ambition to grow and an ability to create jobs. So what can the grant be used for? Well, the grant be used, can be used to fund um, basic items. And actually, if you're thinking of spending money on your business at the, the, at the moment, then it would be worth having a conversation with the advice team. It's better to make... Uh, the project fit your business rather than making your business fit the project. Um, if you are thinking of investing, if you're thinking of recruiting, then it would be a good conversation to have with us. Um, we we'll pay for website development and IT equipment and office furniture. Um, what it can't be used for is stock or working capital, ongoing marketing costs or other ongoing costs such as rent rate and salaries. And that job creation figure, the guideline is uh, one full-time equivalent for every 5,000 of grant. So you really do have to be on your trajectory for this to work for your business. In terms of paperwork, um, we've been talking this morning a little bit about the process and what's involved. So when the grant officer meets with the business for the first time, they'll create a company record and discuss the application. And then there's some finer detail that has to accompany that application. It is only a four-page application, unlike the 20 that was mentioned. 
um, we do need to see a business plan and some accounts, even if it's in draft. And the cash flow forecast and the sales forecast, which would enable us to estimate the margin. And then the process itself, well, that depends on the strength of the application. And again, there's been a bit of uh, conversation about that this morning. If you know your stuff and you're confident with where you're headed, then that will be a fairly easy conversation. If, however, you're not clear and you need a bit of advice time and additional coaching and support, then we can provide that. It's not something that we're going to rush into. So all the documents are submitted and verified and the grant officer prepares a report with a recommendation. And then there's a pre-panel meeting where we discuss the strength of the business case of the applicant. Um, and then that goes forward to a panel meeting and it's at this point where a decision is made. And if it's approved, then a grant agreement is issued. So before I, I uh, jump on to Torchbearer, I'll just uh, again repeat something that again has been said earlier, that uh, the grant is paid in arrears, so people would have to be able to be in a position that they can cash flow the costs of what's been offered, and then they claim it back retrospectively. And the claim process takes about two weeks. So um, we do check that clients are in a position to get into that before we move forward. Okay, so I've just got a couple of case studies here. Uh, Torchbearer is uh, one such uh, client that we work with. Founded in 2016 by John Langley and Peter Wall, with a combined 16 years of experience in software development. Um, and the business was already being supported by two private investors. Uh, but their client list included Nintendo, Switch, FinTech, and Gisto Software. And we funded their new premises move in 2019. We, we paid 50% of their office equipment costs to help them with their move. And there's a lovely quote there from Pete that says how they accessed uh, wider parts of the program besides the grant, and that that uh, really made a difference to their growth trajectory. And it is something that you can dip in and out. Um, and we're running until 2023. The next case study was the Made by Studio, and this was founded in 2019 by Matt Miller and Sam Taylor. They met at Leeds University and won some cash in office space at Nexus in a business competition. They secured a number of contracts, including one with Medical Aid International, and they needed to purchase high-speed Macs to deliver on the contract. So they accessed 50% of the match funding from us for some of their costs and their profits are up tenfold this year. And again, there's another little quote there that uh, they felt sure that the support that they have made a difference to the speed of their growth, which is really the point of a, a growth programme. And then the third one, uh, you may well have come across this company, they've just got a, a number of vans out about in Leeds City Centre actually giving out samples. It's founded by Morten Toft, a Danish-born, Leeds-based entrepreneur who set up Meatless Farm. And the company supplies vegan foods, mostly under white label brands, although uh, they are doing their own thing now as well. They use pea-based protein and soya and developed a range of burgers, patties, and meatless meatballs. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and they with adventure grant officers to obtain a grant for lab equipment and office fit out. Since then, they now employ 100 staff <coughs> and recently opened factories in Canada, Israel, and the US. So again, another rapid growth trajectory. So to get in touch with us, you can either have a chat with us now, or you can go to uh, the Adventure website and register, and we'll take you from there. Any questions? How long will the adventure program run for? I mean, it's obviously funded by the RDF. And, and how long will it run? And have you got any plans for what's next? This funding round runs until March 2023. And then um, there is talk already of some further investment. Um, because of the amount of investment that we've had over the last, is it four years, five years? Um, six years, right? <laughs> then um, I think there would be a, a reluctance to just see it by the dust. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, what's a typical expenditure that you actually do provide the funding on then? Well, 
when the average grant value. Yeah. yeah. No, but you say it's fifty percent, but what what is the expenditure that you would that so, that yeah that somebody um, puts in a business plan yeah. that, that you would fund? Is it yeah. is it more capital? Or? Because of the lockdown yeah. and the interruption to business by COVID, we've done a special round of grant awards of lower value grants of up to five thousand. So the project value for that is around the ten thousand mark. So we've kept that going with our step one grants now. So that would be, I think the average award for those lower value grants is about 8,000 for um, in total project value. So they'd come in at four and a half um, and uh, look at nine for uh, total project value. The higher value grants, it's interesting because it's an all or nothing thing. They come in with real ambition, wanting the full amount. And then after we've scrutinised it and we've fixed the cash flow, and if we think it's going to make their cash flow difficult, then we, we will try and uh, narrow that down a bit. So it can be anything from around 15 to the, the 25 or 50,000 and 30,000 project value. Yeah. But we are very flexible. We'd like to say yes. We try and say yes where we can. The programme is to look at stimulating the economy and creating jobs. So if we can get that, then we're happy. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Father. So we're going to take a 15-minute break. Um, we'll put the live stream on pause, oh, yeah. and everybody can just grab a coffee or a glass of water at the back of the room, and we'll start again in 15 minutes. Thank you. So the next speaker is going to be Alex Beersley from ABL, who's going to tell us about loans and alternative funding. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so as it says, yeah, my name's Alex. I'm founder and joint managing director of ABL. Um, we're a commercial finance intermediary, so I'm going to talk to you purely about debt today, um, debt for businesses, debt in particular for tech scale-ups, but we've um, raised around 300 million for businesses since we've been established um, in the debt space. So I'm going to talk to you about how debt can be used, how you can use it for your tech scale, and then uh, answer questions at the end. So um, our business really exists in the debt space to combine um, everything that's out there. So the speakers that have been on before have talked about specific projects other than dry out that talked about grant funding. But really, there's a whole ecosystem of finance out there um, that looks at various funding options depending on where your business is in its life cycle, um, what it is that you're trying to do, and debt can often sit really nicely alongside equity. Um, particularly within the tech world, there's a lot of talk about equity finance, raising equity. You'll be get investment readiness through Garbutt and Elliott takes you through your pitch, but. Debt is something that's used in businesses across the life cycle and as you will find out today, it can be used alongside venture capital and equity and for various different reasons. So today we're going to really talk about venture debt which covers this in between seed and series A to plug that gap, um, but if you've got any questions I'll answer at the end. So what is venture debt? Well, venture debt has really been born out of uh, venture capital and um, the rise in alternative finance since the 2008 crash. So prior to 2008, banks were really the only place that businesses could go for uh, finance and lending and they'd look at venture capital, they'd look at loans. But post the crash, where banks look to de-risk their portfolios, there's still lots and lots of cash out there, people with cash, angel investors, venture capital funds, and then debt finance. So venture debt has been around, I think, since the number the, the lenders that I'm thinking about since 2011, but before. But really, it's funding aimed at high growth scale-ups that um, don't fit banking parameters, but want the flexibility to be able to take control of their own business and move it forward, um, and not dilute their equity or take them from one series funding, so seed funding, through to series A, or from series A through to the next. 
It is a loan, so I'm trying to dress this up really in lots of different ways, but ultimately, <laughs> venture debt is a loan, and it's usually repayable between 36 and 60 months, which is three to five years. There are some lenders out there that have a repayment profile over eight years, but really, you're looking at the repayable time, and that repayment is key in debt, because debt has to be repaid. So the difference between this and venture debt and venture capital is that venture capital is you looking at borrowing probably more money than what you can with debt because the repayment is not realised until the end. They're looking at the value of shares at the end of a period, whereas venture debt is um, looking at your ability to pay it back. So it's aimed at young businesses, innovative and fast growing. Um, it's available earlier and usually in larger amounts than traditional bank lending, but you can actually combine the two. So you can use debt along with venture capital, and it's all about flexibility. It's all about what you want to do within your business. You have to have a um, show sure track record, but you don't have to have profitability. You just have to have revenue generation. Um, and it, the difference is that actually they're looking at the future growth and what you will do in the future, whereas banks and traditional lenders are looking at the value of your assets, what security you have, but this is really focusing on the, the venture, where you're going. So how would venture debt be used? So the, there's lots of different ways and we work with businesses um, to find debt when they've already got equity in place. And it may be that, I can't mention any names because we're always under NDA because particularly if they've got equity funding in there's venture capital or investors. Um, but to give an example, we worked with a business who was uh, developing a software platform for the logistics sector. They had received £10 million in equity to be able to focus on that platform, but they needed to do M&A activity purchase a number of businesses to do a buy and build to put that software into to prove that it worked. But the tax implications, I'm not a tax expert, but I'm sure that the guys at Garbanelli can help there. The tax, the tax implications wrapped around the equity finance meant that they couldn't use it to, for M&A activity. So they've got 10 million quid sat there in the bank and they need to fund this growth. So there is 2 million plus and use debt to be able to do that, to buy these businesses. Similarly, um, it can help extend the cash runway. So if you're in between uh, fundraisers and you're looking at doing a project or you need a bit more money and you don't want to dilute the equity at this point or you're not quite ready, then you can, and you've got the cash flow, you're generating income, you can use Venture Debt to provide working capital, to give you more headroom to the next stage. It's really, really flexible. It's all about your business plan and the ability to make the repayments. And as we'll come on, you, you can structure it in different ways to make it fit your business, not with some of these other things that we've discussed today in that it's very, your business has to fit their parameters. It's much more flexible, but it's more expensive and you've got to show that you're gonna repay. So are you ready to consider venture debt? Because it's, it's not for everybody, um, but, it's for SMEs within um, tech businesses that where 50% of their revenue comes from the UK. Um, really what they're wanting to see is businesses that are actually revenue generating. So it says up there that you've got an annual revenue reaching 2 million. That doesn't mean profitability, but actually sales, because what we need is the cash to be able to see that the repayments of the debt are gonna be coming through. But that 2 million, it's not a definite, so as with anything, there are different lenders in different spaces that will look at an application based on the business. So I'm submitting an application tomorrow um, of a business that only has revenues of 800,000, but actually the business plan, when they've borrowed the five million, you can see where it's going to go. So it's just taking a view, and I think Sarah at Mercy has said earlier that actually it's about the product, the management team, and you can see the difference in a business that's actually going somewhere and that isn't, and the numbers you know, tell that. And it's got to have an established customer base, got to have a functioning product, so we're past MVP and moving into revenue generation. 
Um, it can be equity backed or privately owned, you know, there can be equity stake in there and actually you can still get venture debt to fund projects, working capital, capital purchases. Um, most importantly, is it in a high growth sector? So they're looking for high growth, fast scaling, cash generative businesses because you've got to be able to make the repayments. So as I said at the start, it's still a loan. So how is it structured? Um, really, you're looking at venture debt as a requirement outside of the Northern Powerhouse Investment Fund. So there's Mercia have a fantastic fund where they will lend between 100,000 and a million for venture debt purposes. But outside of that, you're looking at 2 million to 10 million in terms of funding requirement. Um, and the interest rate will always be between 10 and 12%. Um, what's really good is that you can structure it in any way that you want really to fit the business so it can be drawn down in tranches so for example if you want to borrow five million this business I just uh, referred to you don't have to draw it all down in one go because that would mean that the interest costs would start from day one and the capital repayment you can actually draw it down a million now a million in next year and what that allows you to do is it allows you to future plan and gives you the flexibility that actually you can do all the things that you want to with your business in the future and that funding is set there but actually you're not paying for it now um, in addition to that you can take an interest only period at the start of it so for between 6 to 12 months where you just make the capital repayments again helping with your monthly cash flow all of this depends on your cash flow forecast and the ability to repay. The team at Garbett and Elliot can help with that. We don't do that. We just match you with the right funders to be able to provide the debt finance. Um, but also, you can repay with a bullet payment at the end of specific terms. So again, I'll go back to five million, but you've borrowed five million, you've drawn down in three tranches, you've drawn the rest down, it can be structured where you make the capital and interest repayments for three million over the term of the loan. So you're paying back three million over five years. And then at the end, you're paying two million as a bullet because what you're saying, basically your exit. So on exit, we're gonna have all this cash in because we've sold or we've achieved a new contract or, and so you make that bullet payment. And it, it just shows that how flexible venture debt can actually be. There's no board seats. There's very limited covenants. There's, um, you can structure it in a way that suits the business. So really, as a founder that's not looking to dilute equity, that's not looking to dilute yeah, their equity, or that's looking for a bit more flexibility, you can see how it can be a really, really useful form of financing um, to take it to that next level, or to do that specific project, or um, to move the business forward. And this is not in arrears. So, you know, <laughs> you could get this and then move on to your grant funding that's in arrears. So again, it just gives you control as a founder and allows you to stay in control of the business as long as you can make the repayments. But as with anything, it's all about the application. So that ability to repay, I've reiterated all the way through. And the, the, the applications are very much the same. You know, you pitch or Sarah mentioned uh, from Mercia, it's, what do you do? Who's doing it? How are you going to repay it? You know, venture debt is all about a belief in your business plan. It's a belief that actually you're going to execute something and these are the funds that you're going to use to do it. Um, we've currently got another business that is looking at um, sending satellites into space and the data, the software element uh, is funded by equity and the data collection but actually they need to purchase these satellites and get them up there perfect for venture debt but it's all fixed around the numbers the due diligence and getting that application right who's the management team company financials in a venture debt situation are key because they're going to be scrutinized what happens if you don't hit those sales outputs what happens in the worst case scenario if you can't repay the debt? These are all things that they want to see that you've actually thought about and you're working through because obviously they're giving you money, 
you're going to go spend it, they want to make sure that you're going to be able to repay it back. Have you got a strong management team? I think I've whisked through that really, really fast, but <laughs> it's a loan. <laughs> <laughs> it's a loan, and, um, but it's for innovative, high-growth reasons, and you have to have a strong application, you have to know what it's for, and the business has to be robust and revenue-generating. Um, our business, ABL, we deal with debt, not just at a venture level, but right down to 100000 for a CNC machine or purchase of a, you know, um, I don't even know, whatever, commercial finance. Um, we um, can look at it all. And so whatever your commercial finance requirement, if you speak to us, we can chat to you. We deal with Dryad. We deal with Mercia. We work with all of these businesses and we are a bit of a um, gateway, really, because the business comes to us and says, look, this is what I'm trying to, to do. And then we'll go, OK, well, you need to speak to them, them, them and them. And, and it might not be that you're ready for debt, but it might be at some point in your journey. Um, and so all we ask is that if you've got a commercial finance requirement or you're considering venture debt, um, that come and speak to myself or a member of the team. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. We, we saw in the other presentation that uh, timing is key in, in most of the, the grants and the, and the um, investments. So what would be the perfect moment to start thinking about venture debt? Well, this is where um, the, the, the beauty of debt is that uh, if you want money, you can have it within the next 8 to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, your application is important, but it can be done relatively quickly. There are people out there with the money. If you've got the business, the financials, then it's quite quick. And I say 12 weeks, but, you know, it, it could be four if, mm -hmm. if everything's there. The, the speed and flexibility of debt financing, because it's all based on what's there right now um, is much quicker than, than equity raising or grant funding. So what, what sort of, um, when they actually make, when the companies make the, the loan, the, the debt, what do they it's, um, actually get a guarantee or security on, on there? business? Well often there'll be a bit of an equity kicker so no they'll, they'll take a warrant um, but really that's not not always but um, for more riskier deals there'll, there'll be something written in the contract that actually they can buy shares at the value that the business is now but only one to two percent with an option to sell those later on but at the the due diligence is quite stringent so you know you as part of the process of applying for venture debt, there's going to be an external accountancy practice or uh, in, uh, analyzer looking at the numbers, making sure that actually these numbers stack up. You're going to make that, you know, there's a market analysis that they look at, and so the due diligence process is quite stringent. But um, the security is none. In some cases, they don't even take personal guarantees. Mm -hmm. Uh, so is venture debt uh, applicable to all uh, tech scale-ups? It, it's not applicable to all because it depends, as, as with anything, on the actual business itself, where it is in the life cycle, what they're trying to achieve, and whether or not it's revenue generating. So, you know, in order to get venture debt, you need to show that you're going to be able to pay back. So revenue generation is key in this instance. Um, but again, it provides greater flexibility, it can work with venture capital, so if there's extra needed. So it, it depends on the individual business, tech business situation. Fab, thank you very much. Well, I'm always available, um, and the team, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Twitter. Give me a call. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Helen Oldnam from uh, North Invest and she will tell us about angel investments. Yeah. Morning everybody. Morning. Morning. Thanks Vivian. Vivian was having a small panic thinking I wasn't here because we're slightly ahead of schedule but I sneaked in at the back. So <laughs> I've, I've heard Alex speak before and she has some really good technical advice. Thank I learn something from that every time. Thank you. Um, so. 
I'm going to tell you a bit about the North Invest story because as I was driving here this morning, I had a sudden realisation that actually we're four years old from our sort of operational birthday. We actually registered the business in 2015, um, which was when I was at the Yorkshire Post as the managing director and at that time we'd set up a tech incubator inside the Yorkshire Post. We had 15 business startups there and uh, we provided them with a mix of media coverage and mentoring and I absolutely loved that environment and at that time I met Adam Beaumont and we were talking about angel investment at that point there was nothing in Yorkshire that filled that early stage funding gap because the previous uh, organisation which was called Yabba had uh, deceased um, <laughs> as part of the Yorkshire Forward um, uh, end of life situation because they were pretty much funded from that organisation. So we decided we were going to set up an angel network. Um, we did quite a bit of talking about it for a couple of years, but then excitingly in 2017, I'm pretty sure it was September the 9th, we took on our first employee, somebody called Jack Colpen, who I was very excited to see on LinkedIn has gone off. He was also running his own business at that time, which is one of the reasons why we were keen to take him on. He's an entrepreneur and has launched a business called Sponsor My Society and he's hit the half million revenue uh, turnover point in his business, which is phenomenal, so good to Jack. So yeah, we've been around since 2017 as a real thing. We exist to fund diverse northern early stage innovation. So our sort of reason for being is very much around making sure that the north of England has that very vital early stage funding. Those of you who've seen stats about um, seed funding will know that the majority of seed funding, particularly through angel networks, takes place in the south of England, sadly. Um, and the statistic hasn't changed that much actually since 2017, despite our best efforts. And I'll go on and show you some of the things that we've done on some later slides, but 75% of all angel investing is centred around the south of England. Um, and that means that building angel capacity and having that early stage funding is particularly vital to this part of the world. We take our footprint as the northern powerhouse region, so we stretch right up to the Scottish borders, down to Chesterfield, and then border to border. Um, and we have two criteria really, you've got to be in that area and you've got to be a tech or innovation based business to make an application through the North Invest uh, platform. Um, so yeah, here's a, a little bit about our, our starting point. Um, we actually started off with um, 20 of people that we knew as the Angel Network back in 2017. Again, in my mind, I was reliving those moments. We really did know nothing. Um, my background was not finance. Uh, my background was not starting a community from scratch. Um, and we had quite a lot of entrepreneurs come towards us in the first six months, but had a fast realization that without investors, that's not really going to work. So we then f flipped and just concentrated on building the investment network. And by the time we'd reached the summer of 2018, we had 50 angels in the network and we had our first pitch event and that was so exciting. Um, we were also super blessed because Bromwood said, yes, you can come and use the business lounge for meetings and you can use this area here. So this is the actual room where we had the, the first ever pitch event. And from that moment on, it became a real thing. And the network has grown pretty rapidly from then uh, to the point now where we're at 160 members. Um, we've had a few drop out, but hardly any. Um, and organically, we're growing at a rate of one angel per week who are onboarding, them, onboarding themselves through our North Invest website. And that's with very little uh, outbound uh, reach from us. We do more on the female investing side, and I'm going to go on and t tell you a little bit about that. Uh, in a second. Um, we're different because we're a not-for-profit, so there's no one who's earning huge fees or salaries at the back end of North Invest. And actually, we just about cover our costs every year. We plough every penny that we generate in terms of revenue into our, our team. Uh, we started off with a team of 1.6 people, and we've got about five now. 
Um, so it's still pretty lean, but they are super effective. And we've got a combination of um, employees and freelance staff, which means that we can be super agile and sort of dial up and dial down when we need to. But I would say mainly we're super busy all the time. Um, and then the other reason why we're different is because we do not charge the startup. And as far as I'm aware, we're the only organisation of our kind that doesn't charge the startup a fee. And there was a very strong reason why we decided to position the business in that way because there are multiple providers charging all sorts of fees. It can be quite confusing if you're an entrepreneur. So we decided to make it super simple. If you come to us, we'll do everything from uh, looking at your business plan, your pitch deck, uh, supporting you through some investor readiness coaching into a pitch event and get you the funding for nothing. We do charge the investor and you know we've uh, successfully positioned that with all the people that we partner with in terms of investors so both the angels and the wider network um, and you know we find that that means we have very high quality entrepreneurs coming towards us which is helpful when it comes to our investor community as well. Um, we know that um, the north of England has got a huge amount of potential in terms of innovation. Again, we have about four entrepreneurs, five entrepreneurs a week come towards us saying that they're looking for funding. So there's no shortage of uh, really excellent startup businesses ac across the north of England. Um, and we want to make sure that we provide them with that vital funding early stage piece that means that they can go on and scale from there. Um, what we do specifically then is we, because of the, the number of requests we get, the first point of contact is very much the website. So any entrepreneur that's looking for funding will come on to our website. There's lots of advice there about how to put together a pitch deck. Um, but we ask for a very basic business plan and a very basic pitch deck. They don't have to be really fancy, they don't have to be well designed, they just have to tell us something about your story so that we know sort of where you are on the journey and we can take a view on how much help you're going to need from that point onwards. Now if we feel that there's a really long way to go on your journey, we can see there's potential but you may need some intense help we may well then refer you on to another partner to help you on that journey. If we feel that there's some work we can do within the next three to six months, we may well just take it on ourselves and put you through some intense coaching to sort the pitch deck out and maybe to help with the business plan. And we also have a number of amazing partners in our network, of which Garbert and Elliot are one. So if there's business planning support required, we may well refer it to a specialist. Um, so that's basically how it works. We also support a number of investment readiness programs and we've been increasingly active in that area in the last 12 months, for instance, where we'll take a group of entrepreneurs and then give them advice about how to position their, their business for that very first piece of funding. Um, and that might actually be venture debt funding or it could be uh, private equity funding. Um, we then put everybody into a pitch deck who we think uh, are investor ready and typically we're hosting those at least once a month. Um, they're virtual events so during lockdown like everybody we had to go through a, a month of thinking oh my god what are we going to do because um, we've never hosted a virtual event before but flipped to virtual and we actually found because our investor community is based across the whole of the north of England actually more of them showed up. Um, and I'll show you what results those uh, that achieved uh, a little bit later on. So once a month, it's a virtual pitch event. We find that's great because actually it takes quite a lot of bias out of the um, investment conversations as well. It's a bit more of a level playing field as our observation of the virtual event, which is another reason why we favour that. Typically, we'll have six entrepreneurs in that event and we will have around 50 to 30, 15 to 30 investors in there as well. Um, and there's a nice opportunity for the investors to ask questions. And then we will ask who would like to have a follow-up session with the individual uh, entrepreneurs uh, at the end of the pitch event. 
we quite often get asked, is it like Dragon's Den? And the reality is it's a tiny bit like Red Dragon's Den, but you do have to pitch um, and you are going to get asked questions. Um, but we pride ourselves on being very open, being really friendly and supportive. And we always say to our angels, you know, if you can't provide the money or this opportunity is not right for you, what else might you be able to do to help this particular entrepreneur? And quite often it's in the other support we provide that there's a huge amount of value. And we were talking yesterday in our team meeting about trying to quantify that a bit because we do spend a lot of time in that area as well as doing the actual funding connection. And then, again, one of the, reasons, the other areas where we're different from other angel networks is that we tend to play the role of the lead investor quite often in our rounds. So we will actually help move the deal along, keep everybody communicating, try and answer the questions as quickly as possible, which is key to actually closing a round, um, and then get the legal process coordinated, along, working alongside the angels. Um, we have some lead investors who want to do that, um, but we quite often do step in and, and make sure that that happens. Um, and then, you know, we do loads of connecting across the whole of the north of England, and I'm going to show you some of our partners in a second. Um, we've also been working really hard on the diversity piece. It, back in 2017, we actually embedded into our values the fact that we wanted to support a wide range of gender diversity in terms of the investment uh, investments um, close but also the number of female founders that we helped and the number of women investors we had in the network i i actually thought that was going to be quite straightforward um, but you know a year on which was 2018 we realized we've made a little bit of progress but not much so we worked with the UK BAA to set up a huge event at the Queen's Hotel, actually, where we had 100 potential women investors come along and hear all about the sector, about how interesting it is to support early stage businesses, not just be from a financial return perspective, but also from providing your skills, your expertise, and your mentoring and um, positivity to help them move forward. Um, and we got quite a number of female investors joined us at that point. Then we had a little bit of a hiatus and did something similar again um, earlier this year online this time. Um, and again, we've had about 17 new women investors join from that one event. So the reason why this is important is because there's a big piece of research from the UK BAA that says that if you're a woman investor, you're more likely to back a female founder and your portfolio is likely to be 50% made up of investments uh, from female founders. So there's a clear correlation between the number of women investors you have in your network and the number of uh, women founders that you can support. So I'm really delighted, I don't have this on the slide because I was just looking at the stats this morning, but when I'm looking at the investments that we've helped facilitate this year, actually 40% of them have been for female founders, so it's our best ever result. Um, I've got a couple of other slides coming up a bit later on about what we're doing specifically in that area. So in terms of um, funding, we do two things. One is we have our angel network, but then we have a whole huge network of funding partners. So VCs, funds, family offices, particularly in the north of England, we, we all know everybody I think now. It's taken us quite a long time to get to that point. I would say there are very few organisations now that we don't know or have a contact with. And increasingly we've also been building our relationship with a number of London uh, funders as well. But these are the ones that we've actually uh, co-invested with in the last couple of years. Um, we have ongoing conversations that don't always materialise going on all the time. And I would say one thing from my observation of what's changed in the last four years is there's a lot more collaboration in the networks. Um, people realising that actually when you come together around a, a startup, actually it's much better for the startup because you've got a broad range of funding and broad range of support uh, and easier to fill the rounds if you all work together. Um, so it can still be a bit cutthroat, but a lot, I would say, much more collaborative than it used to be. Um, so last year's statistics, so we were 
obviously hit by COVID, flipped to virtual, and then found ourselves in this situation where we actually doubled the number of pitch events that we held because we used to hold them alternate months. Um, and because the more angels turned up, some of that was because they didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> so getting people into the events was really quite straightforward, particularly last year. So we had what we thought was a, well, it is a, a really strong result last year with 19 deals completed. We did 10 year, the year prior to that, uh, and 9 million altogether uh, in joined up funding across uh, our own network and co-investment. And we had 215 applications. So we've started this year just as strongly, so we've already closed 10, which is ahead of this point last year. We always find that September to December is actually the most active period. Uh, it's mainly because it's our year end as well, so we tend to try and close stuff just before Christmas as well, <laughs> being totally honest. Um, but we will hit at least that number. I think potentially we might go a bit over it as well. Um, just so you can see, how our footprint works across the north of England. We've got 22% last year of opportunities coming from the Leeds city region. Um, I suspect that's probably because we started here. Um, and you know, because this is a, a Leeds digital festival event, obviously we've got a very strong affinity with Leeds. I wouldn't normally say that if I was in Manchester or Newcastle. <laughs> um, but we love to support the, the, the Leeds uh, ecosystem. 16% from Manchester, 20% from the North East, actually, where we spend quite a lot of time showing up at different events. 14% from the North Yorkshire area, and then 30% from all of the rest. Um, so a pretty good mix, I think, and balanced across three main, major conurbations in the North. Um, interestingly, our angel community is split in about the same percentages as well, so about 20% of our angels are also from Leeds or nearby uh, and that's pretty important if you've got investors who particularly want to support something hyper local um, so in lockdown last year as well we had this moment of realizing that whilst we were supporting female founders and we had a very active uh, female founder female investor network which we used to run alternate months there was still lots more to do i also had been speaking to all, lots of different vcs across the north of england uh, and finding that inside, typically I was connected to a woman inside those VCs, which is interesting. And um, when I got talking to them, they all said, oh no, we're really interested in changing this too. And we've been trying to change this inside our own organizations and finding it difficult because we're a lone voice. So I thought, well, why don't we all come together? Because if we come together, our voices will be louder and it will force some internal change inside all of those organizations but also we will actually be able to make a, a significant difference. So we've launched an organisation called Fund Her North. We did that back in October of last year, so it's just October the 14th, coming up to our first anniversary there. It has gone absolutely bonkers. We can barely keep up with the interest that we've had in that organisation. It's for all entre female entrepreneurs, right from start-up, so seed funding, right through to scale up and exit. And we have got partners in the network that can support on every single stage of that. The aim is that we all handhold the entrepreneur through our own organisations, um, uh, but we would also provide any other support that we can do. We've provided mentors, we've provided um, some board members as well already. We've managed to raise over two million pounds of funding for early stage uh, female led businesses and we have some specific female only pitch events that we run as part of fund her north they're the only female founder only pitch events in the north of england which i was astonished by when we looked at it they were the only ones um, so we're really carrying on with that leveling up agenda particularly as if you're in london this is not so uncommon mm -hmm. You know, there are other things, uh, probably multiple organisations you could tap into as a female founder. We've had 800, over 800 people come to our different events. We've launched um, a website where the URL's there. On average, you could, we get one new member signing up a day, um, mainly entrepreneurs, but also investors, just coming to that site and signing up. We've um, managed to pull together a really high profile advisory board, so we've got the chair of KPMG UK, we've got 
the chair of the UK Business Angels, the chair of the British Venture Capital Organisation, um, uh, yeah, who are all supporting us, and we've got NatBest and UBS on board as well. So that's exciting. Um, other big news, um, we've also been given the opportunity to extend the runway with our Innovate UK grant funding. So in a trial, um, we were given a million pounds. Uh, we had to apply through a competition to be a partner to do that. We won, we had a million pounds to divest and we did that in 18 months um, when we were given something like a two and a half year runway to do it. We went back and lobbied hard uh, to central government to say that was a trial and it's gone really well, hasn't it? They all said yes, but we don't know what we're doing now because of the budget and COVID and blah, blah, blah. So we actually thought that that was it, despite the fact we'd done really well. We'd uh, invested to eight rounds of funding in that programme. Um, but they came back to us and said, not only are we going to give you more, we're going to give, we're going to give you two million and we need you to divest that really quickly as well. So this is uh, grant funding, um, it will enable us to uh, leverage angel funding alongside it, which is how the mechanic works, and it's for R&D essentially, or anything that's sort of high innovation uh, focused, but it means again that if you're a startup and you are particularly um, requiring some project based funding, we can do that alongside the angel money, which is super good. Um, from a sort of diversity perspective, we've also been working with Aid Ventures and set up um, their scouting program with them. So we've been looking at trying to find more diverse founders in communities across the north of England and held a big event with them, which basically is saying we would like people from those communities to be a scout for the entrepreneurs in their community and to give them all the support they might need right from just having an idea or thinking they might launch a business. Um, and then Ada actually provides some funding uh, through their uh, fund. I think they've got 30 million in that. So we've helped to recruit a whole load of uh, scouts. And with Bethnal Green Ventures, again, we've been working with them to uh, get northern based entrepreneurs into their really, really fantastic accelerator programme. It has limited numbers, you get 30Ks worth of funding alongside as, as well. So it's a, a really good programme, that one. Um, a quick case study from here. This one was a female founder who came to us at the beginning of 2020. We've actually managed to support two rounds of funding for this business since then. It's, it, it, it's an interesting one. It's actually a social media platform for dogs. Um, but anybody who's got a dog who's, or who's in the dog community that will know that it's really fast growing. It's basically a play for advertising to run alongside it. It's going really quickly and we were able to place a non-exec and get some in-kind support for them for their marketing and their go-to-market strategy. And yeah, so really nice feedback there from Becky uh, with her dog. <laughs> so I, the only other thing I was going to mention is that our partners, we're just really um, grateful that we've got amazing partners. We're working with Vivian and the team and with Garbett and Elliot, but also with a number of other partners who help us to provide the support to the entrepreneur community in the north of England. We couldn't do it without them. Um, yeah, so, and, you know, thanks for everybody who supported us in the four years. It's been a pretty amazing journey, but one that we've all really enjoyed. So, the time ran out there so quickly. I was so grateful for the prompt, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, any questions from anybody? It's quite warm in here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. you mentioned we could get in touch with you with a quite basic uh, pitch deck. What yes. does that pitch deck have to include? Okay, so ideally what you want to include in your pitch deck in an ideal world is why you started this business. So generally speaking, the pitches that get the most traction are the ones where there's a really compelling personal story at the, end, at the beginning of it. You know, what, why did you do this? And being an entrepreneur is really hard, isn't it? I mean, I, when I've worked alongside entrepreneurs in the last four years, it's given me an even greater respect for how tough it is out there, um, and particularly through the last two years and all that uncertainty. 
So yeah, why did you start it and what's keeping you going? And if there's a personal connection or a connection into markets that are going to be useful, study it there. Then what is your business and why is it unique? And what is the problem you're trying to solve? So those things at the front end of the presentation, particularly like what is the problem you're trying to solve? And then going on to explain how you can prove that that is a real problem by showing that you're getting some traction in the market. Now, 50% of the businesses we support are pre-revenue, so it doesn't have to be revenue generative at this point. However, you do need to be able to prove that there is a market there. So either by building a community or by doing some research or you know, there are other things you can do to prove that your product is actually going to have a market when you go out. Um, the next thing would be um, talking about how you're going to build that business. So what are your plans in terms of the go-to-market perspective? You know, if you've got a community, how are you going to grow that? How are you going to monetize that? What are the early conversations that you're having? Um, who's in your team? You know, I know Alex was talking and um, Sarah talked at the beginning from Mercia about how important team members are. Um, super important that you've got a broad mix of experience and uh, approach that could be complementary to your business because most investors are looking for, is this a team I can support? And then at the end, some basic business financial modeling that shows how your business is gonna go from where you are today. You could possibly go backwards if there, if there is some history there that's useful. And then going forward to the next three to five years, how that business is gonna grow. And then last, what is your ask? I'm looking for X amount of money in return for X amount of equity, which means you probably need to have a business valuation in there. So those would be my top tips. The ones where there's this personal story are always the ones that people remember. Um, so I, I, you've got to have the other stuff, but that will really help get you noticed and make you memorable. So thanks for the question. Anything else? So um, I'm interested in what defines a northern business because yeah. at the moment lots of people are, yeah, you're, I'm looking at contractors all over England because I, I can't necessarily find uh, people to work on it in Leeds. So what, what defines a northern business? So your business is registered here though, isn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah. So that would, that would count. So we, Generally speaking, we say, first of all, ideally we would like the businesses to be registered in the north of England. If that's not the case and it still looks really interesting, the next go-to place would be you must have a, a reasonable number of people based in the north of England. So it's going to support the northern economy in some way. Then if you're neither of those things, we probably are going to say no unless you will relocate. Um, we have had a number of businesses come towards us who've said, if you can get the funding, we'll come, and then have done. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's mainly how we work. I mean, if we felt it was still a brilliant opportunity, we'd pass you on to someone else who can help, we wouldn't just leave it. Um, so we have really strong angel network connections into London and in other parts of the UK. Any, any last questions? Oh, well, it's great to be at an in-person event here yes, at, yes. at Bromwood, working alongside Dryad, so thanks very much, Vivian, for the invitation, and enjoy the rest of the Leeds Digital Festival. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. So our last speakers will be uh, Simon Palmer and James Wright from Garbage and Elliot, um, who will tell us about our R&D tax credit and investment schemes. Hi everyone, um, my name is James Wright, um, I'm from Garbett and Elliott and we're a firm of chartered accountants and business ta uh, so tax advisors. Um, we have an office in York and Leeds and we have about 200 staff so we're a relatively large regional firm and we have clients all across the north of England. Um, we're here today to talk about two specific tax um, sort of reliefs and sort of uh, tax advantage investments that you can have in your com in com company. Oh, sorry. 
Right, so um, my colleague Simon, who was one of our partners, he was talking about, about the SEIS and EIS investments um, after I've talked about RD. Um, so that's basically what we're doing. We've got questions answered in. Right. So research development tax relief claims. Um, these are fantastic tax relief. Um, and it's one of our, in the SWOT tax team that I work in, it's one of our focuses. Um, it's a long standing tax relief now, it's been around for over 20 years, um, but, and it's, the government really loves it, and they do push, they want entrepreneurial businesses and innovation. Um, ultimately, it does support the economy, helps grow the business, helps grow, help business grow, which eventually grows the economy and employs people. So it's a fundamental part of the sort of government policy and has been for many, many years. However, historically, a lot of companies that could have claimed have not claimed. For the first 10 years, the, ma the amount of money that was actually claimed, the companies were claiming were pretty you know, low. Um, it's only been in the last sort of five or six years we've actually seen a fairly rapid growth. Um, and to give you just sort of flavour, there's currently, the sort of latest statistics are there were 60,000 claims um, by various companies, and they t claimed a total of five billion pounds worth of tax relief. So it, it's a very substantial, um, potential tax relief for, for your business, for a business, so it is worth considering. Um, now, I've not, I've not put this um, error and fraud figure up there on there to, to scare you or anything, but HMRC are aware that there are people that are taking liberty with the system, per se, and HMRC now, because they think they've got around about £300 million pounds worth of fraud in the system at the moment, so they are taking a closer view on things, so it is important to make sure that your claims are legitimate, um, just purely because they are, they have been looked at more often now, so it does require a little bit more care and attention when you're actually doing a claim. However, there are still a lot of businesses that are not claiming, so it's always worth having a discussion with somebody like Albert and Elliot to assess whether or not it is a good idea, whether you're actually possible to make a claim. Um, right, so starting off, there are two types of R&E claims. Now, most small businesses, which would be, tend to be startups, they will, you will qualify for the SME claim, now I've put the limits up there, and these are probably something you probably won't achieve for many, many years if you're a new business. Um, so I mean, it'd be a nice, nice thing to be get to that kind of size of business. They're all in euros because it's still tied in with the EU. We agreed when we were still members of the EU. Um, I don't know what's going to change or not back into pounds or not. Um, the only reason I'm, so I'm discussing the second scheme is because, as Vivian mentioned earlier, if you've got subsidised R&D with grants, you probably won't be able to claim the SME um, scheme purely because you've been funded, but there is another scheme you can claim and it just means tax relief slightly less. Um, this, the SME scheme is really brilliant. You effectively get 130% on top of the expense you've already spent as an extra tax deduction from your um, company's results. So for every pound you spend, you're getting effectively £2.30 going through. Um, so it's a really brilliant relief. And the other bonus to this particular scheme is that if you're a new startup and you're pre-revenue or even if you're loss making, you've got a limited amount of income, you can actually consider the losses that are created by them, you can actually consider surrendering them to HMRC and getting a tax credit repayment back from them straight away, which is a really good cash injection for your business, and you get a 14.5% back of the losses you surrender. The alternative is you carry them forwards, but you've got to achieve a profit to actually use them then. So for a new business, if you don't expect to make profits for a number of years, this is potentially a good idea. Um, to get some cash back straight away. Um, the other scheme is the Research and Development Expenditure Credit Scheme. Now this typically is for normal for larger companies. However, if you've got grant funding, you might fall into this bracket, or at least part of your R&D might fall into this bracket. Um, it's slightly less generous um, in that you don't get an extra tax deduction. What happens is you actually get your, t your qualifying expenditure R&D purposes and you 13% of that gets deducted um, off your tax calculation and effectively that might generate a repayment. However, the slight quirk is it's actually a taxable um, credit from your tax liabilities. So you actually the resultant um, benefit is actually on 10.53 based upon a 19% tax rate as it stands. Um, so what qualifies for um, tax rate? So these are the qualifying costs. Effectively there's two parts to claim. Um, and the first thing probably most people want to consider is the cost. Um, so the biggest thing probably most businesses will encounter will be staff costs, um, which includes all your sort of typical things like salaries, 
your employer's national insurance and your employer's pension contributions, but it can also include reimbursed expenses, which typically might be travel expenses, say the employee needs to travel to a different site from the normal working um, location. Uh, and the other common thing that we find in certain tech businesses is subcontractor costs, where you might have to get a, maybe a software developer in or something like that who's got expertise that you simply don't have as a business just yet, and you would you engage them to do some of the work for you. The only little caveat to that is that if that subcontractor isn't connected to your business, you can only claim 65% of the cost as a qualifying r and expense. Um, this is a little bit less common, but if you engage in to provide workers to their employees of other companies that you might bring in to do your R&D, but that's quite common with small businesses. It has to be groups to do that. Um, you can also claim on expenditure materials and consumables. Typically, utilities are included in that, and the consumables to be claimed have to be actually consumed in the R&D process. You can't have them in your end product to sell onto your customer. And then also, software costs can also be included. So this is all the software that you might use to actually do your own research. It might be a programming software, or you might have some other sort of, or even if the generic sort of office suites come, a potential percentage of that can be claimed um, if you're using that towards doing your own research. Right, so I thought I'd put this in because it's a little bit topical. So, so there's a lot of COVID support going around at the moment. So if your business has claimed anything, um, it potentially affects the claim because some of it is what we call notified state aid. Um, and that prevents the SME claim from being made that I mentioned earlier, but you would still qualify potentially for the outlet claim. Now, so there's, there's the three loans there. So you've got coronavirus business and structural loan scheme, the coronavirus large business loan scheme, which probably isn't necessarily relevant for, large, for smaller startups, and also bounce back loans. Um, it's also important to note that if anyone's claiming these sort of furlough grants, they don't actually affect the status of the claim. However, you can't actually include any salary costs relating to employees that have actually been in the period that their employees furloughed, because you basically have that funded for you and you haven't spent that money. Um, right, so what is R&D basically? Now this is the HMRC sort of definition. So it's an advance in science and technology through the resolution of scientific or technological research. <coughs> and basically, it, it, that means that you have to be doing something that's either innovative and new, or you might be doing something that somebody else has done before, but you're doing it in a distinctly new and different way to what somebody else has done. Or, for instance, another area that we see quite a lot is people might take an idea that somebody else has developed from maybe a large company, and you might try to achieve the same um, output, but on a shoestring budget, because you're a much smaller business, so you might be looking at a big multinational, and you might think, oh, that idea's quite good. But you try and, you know, effectively, you have to reverse engineer them because um, reverse engineer that. Um, the resolution of the uncertainty, so there has to be something you don't know how to do and you're not quite sure how to solve it, and that's the R&D process itself. So that's how the process of you going through trying to actually solve whatever problem it is you're looking at. The key thing here is it's not a, a, just the uncertainty from your business, it has to be an uncertainty in your particular field. So it's not enough that just your company doesn't have to do it, it has to be the competent professionals in your particular field that this, whatever your idea is, that nobody else is basically doing it, or at least that information is not in the public domain so that everybody hasn't got access to that knowledge yet. And I guess in the tech sector, because things move so quickly, what's today's innovation very quickly will become um, sort of, you know, everybody's doing it kind of thing. So it does, it does move very fast in the sector we looking at. Right, so just to give you an idea of the types of projects that we've seen that do qualify, um, in the sort of tech area and things like that. Um, so you, one area is you could be developing a new or improved data architectures um, that can't be produced from the available solutions at the moment. So effectively you're pushing the boundaries of what's already available. Um, again, you could be extending software framework beyond what it was originally designed to do. So if you've got a legacy piece of software, you might decide that actually I'd like to make it now do this. And that can require a lot of knowledge and expertise to actually extend what it was able to, it was designed to do. Um, and also, you might be, so there might be, an, there might be, say, there might be some thesis out there that some people have done research on and sort of thought, well, well, this might be a good idea, but no one's actually, actually put it into action yet. And you might try and actually design a practical solution and get that into the marketplace. Um, something we also see quite often is that combining technologies and um, software can be R&D, 
but only if it's difficult to work out actually how to do that in the first place. Um, and one good indicator of R&D is a trial and error process and also failure, but only on technical grounds, not just because you don't know what you're doing. Um, so you have to actually get to a dead end effectively. Um, and they, they tend to be an idea, uh, so if you're the already iterative process and you've got coming up against a lot of problems you just have to work around solving and resolving them, it's probably a good idea that a good indication that there is R&D there potentially to look at. Um, and these are things that don't qualify. So effectively if you're assembling things in just a standard way that you do every day, that's something you're interested in do every day, that won't be R&D. Again, routine copying and adapting so software or technology, that wouldn't be qualified. If it's really quick and easy to resolve, it's probably not going to be R&D. Um, and then again, sort of minor changes that you might make, minor tweaks you might make to a piece of software. Again, it, it, there needs to be a substantial sort of amount of work you're putting into it. Things like cosmetic change, so for instance on a user interface you might decide it looks a bit rubbish and you want to modernise it. Um, unfortunately that wouldn't qualify. And again, sort of minor maintenance of the product once it's up and running and also maybe doing minor fault fixing, again wouldn't qualify. But if you were making substantial, if there were substantial errors once you got the actual if you were software you got it working um, and you found a lot of bugs in it then the actual fixing that potentially is still on either if it's significant enough to cause a problem not to work. Right, so just an example to give you an idea of um, the sort of tax savings that can actually achieve here, just how generous the SME scheme actually is. Um, I've just put a work calculation up here. So, and this is not something that's uncommon with a new business. It's not, oh, you know, this is the sort of claims that we see quite regularly. Um, so the staff cost £50,000. Um, we've got an uncontested contractor, so although you spend £20,000, you can only claim £13,000 of that as qualifying cost. And then we've got £10,000 of software license that you can be using your R&D. Now, overall that works out at £73,000 of costs. But when you do your tax computation, you actually get nearly £95,000 actual extra deduction. So you've got nearly £168,000 of costs going through your tax computations. Now, assuming that you're a loss-making business at this point, you could potentially surrender all that £168,000 for a tax repayment straight away, and you're looking at a £24,000 repayment. So it's a fairly substantial chunk. But again, like with most of the release, it is sadly after the event, so you have to spend the money first, unfortunately, and you have to also put your accounts together and your tax computation. So it isn't up front, so you have to fill this up front, unfortunately. Um, and then just a few little practical parts really to finish off. When you're doing the claim, it is important to submit as much information as you can to HMRC, as much evidence as to why you're, what you're doing is amazing um, new R&D. And it's not just standard that everybody's doing. Um, a lot of small businesses consider capitalising R&D costs, certainly a sort of software development kind of projects. However, this doesn't actually stop you claiming the R&D relief. There is something called the Section 1308 election, which actually effectively means we can claim the tax position is exactly the same as if it's just gone through your profit and loss. Um, the only difference is your balance sheet will have an asset on it, which can potentially help with investment because you've got a positive looking balance sheet. Um, from a sort of admin side of things, the R&D claim has to be submitted with your company tax return and your accounts. So you need to have your all that. So you need to have gone past your year and make sure that your accounts and your accounts and your tax computations and return. And also, you should also submit an R&D report. And this effectively tells HMRC it's basically a word doc, it's sort of a descriptive document describing exactly what you're trying to achieve, all the problems you've encountered, and also how you've overcome them. Um, and then that's quite generous with the deadline, so you've got two years from the end of your accounting period. So you've got where well, you sort of tax as you one year after and your accounts are due nine months. So you've actually got quite a long time, you could go back. So if, if you feel like you've missed the boat, you might be able to go back if you you know if you've got go back a couple of years still at this point. And just as a sort of hit, expectation when money, money comes through. Um, basically HMRC will process most claims within four weeks, um, assuming they don't require any more information. And typically we find that the majority, vast majority of claims do go through without any questions. They don't require quite any further information. But again, that goes back to the point of providing enough information in the first place. Because it's just better to do that because any delays with HMRC it can take them quite a while to get back to you. They're not necessarily the most speedy people communicating with either agents or um, members of the public. Right, so hand over to Simon.
Thanks, James. Saw the 10 minute sign there. <laughs> yeah, good stuff, yeah. So, um, how do you just up and down? Yeah, side, 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 yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I'm Simon, I'm one of the partners at Garvin Yeah, It's great, great morning. Um, I've, I've, learned, I've learned a lot, lot today. It's interesting that what James is saying, what, we, what we're actually do with a lot of the R&D is we use it part of the funding package for, 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 for startups. And, uh, and like, so what you're talking about, Alex, the, maybe there's, if, you know, when you talk about those bullet points, it could even be part, the bullet payments could even be part of that if, it, if the claim is big enough. We also, um, because we work, we've actually set our stall out for actually work, working with, with startup businesses uh, within the Leeds City region. We've actually adapted the way we use R&D as well. So we, we actually look after clients. We invariably, if it's a starter, we get them on zero. We get them working on zero. Um, we talk to them a lot. And then we try and, because we know the cash is tight at the start and, and there are, there's a lot of bootstrapping going on, we try and take our fees out of the R&D tax payment right at the end. So it's another way keeping the money within the business, helping them, them grow it, but where they're there they're to support them on, that, on that, that journey. So another tax product, I know this is a bit tax heavy at the end now, but this is without doubt better than r and well, I think so. <laughs> it is the best tax product in the entire world. This is, um, but it, the thing is, for startups, it doesn't actually benefit the startup itself, the company. What, what you use it for is to get the investor to invest in your business. Like, like Helen was talking about um, her, her group of angels. We work with the North Invest. We work with the, the angels there. What all those angels want is your company to be SEIS, EIS compliant from the start. And they'll just take it as read that they are com compl you are compliant from there. They want their tax relief. So this tax relief, now, it's actually just, uh, accountants are terrible at using abbreviations, but it, SEIS is the Seed Enterprise Investment Scheme, and that is the younger brother or sister of the Enterprise Investment Scheme. Now, these, these, are, government, these are government schemes, that, um, I think they've been going, the a, 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 Enterprise Investment Scheme has been going since the early 2000s, but what it does, under seed enterprise, it gives the investor 50% of his investment back against his income tax, or 30% under, under, under EIS. So it can actually take that, your, your investor that you find can take that tax back up to two, two years and claim from a tax return he submitted two years ago or in the, in the current year. Um, there's no, one of the other advantages as well, although the dividends are taxable arising from the shares, it's actually capital gains tax free at the end, end of the three years. I say it's absolutely superb for your, your investor. Um, we, you can actually defer other capital gains in, in, into the investment as well. I'm going to come on to a little example. Um, one of the important things is under, under an SEIS, an individual investor is only limited to 100,000 and he can only invest up to 30% in your business. Um, with EIS, that goes up to, up to one, 1 million. Um, the company limits 150,000 for SEIS. So you can only, if you, when, you, when James make, makes an application, he applies for SEIS and EIS. But you can only invest up to 150,000 under the SEIS. So you, you can use that when you're actually doing a, a call out to all the investors, say, yeah, get in quick, get your 50% tax in first and then before everyone else moves on to, on to the 30%. Now, if there's a special, just recently, 2018 I think it was, uh, a, new, um, uh, a new generation of uh, companies came in called Kix, which are knowledge intensive companies. Now, um, that's actually wrong. The company limit for a knowledge intensive company is actually 12 million pounds. And it actually extends the term of a young company from, okay, two years for SEIS, seven years for EIS, it actually extends it to 10 years. 
So if you've got R, if you if you know companies or you part of a company that's actually ten years old and you're still doing a lot of R and D, you're still doing a lot of knowledge intensive uh, work within your company, you could still get EIS at that point. So just a really quick example so showing the, the advantages. Non-EIS, EIS, C, CDEIS. Or if it's non-EIS and you invest £10,000 and three years later the shares are worth £50,000. Fantastic. The investor's made a profit, he's going to pay capital gains tax at 10%. That's the entrepreneur, that's 10%. Uh, he's going to get his um, entrepreneur's relief on that and he's ended up with a profit of £36,000. Um, if he's actually under EIS, he will actually get to keep the £3,000 tax relief he initially gets, that's 30% of the 10000 so his profit at the end is 43000 Under CDIS, you get the 50% tax relief, which is the £5,000 relief, and you get to keep 45000 at the end. So it gets even better than that. So imagine, um, this is, so when you're actually talking to your investor, it's about getting the investor on board to invest in your business. What an investor is always going to think is he's going to think the risk, the risk, um, uh, I could lose all my money o o overnight. If the conditions are right, under SEIS, an investor could just lose 16% of what he put, puts in if the conditions are right. So just to, there's, a, there's a, like an, a, an income tax relief that's available to everybody that's called loss relief and that's at their highest rate. So let's say under this, the invest £10,000, three years later, the shares are worth absolutely nothing. It's been a failure. But you're, you're talking to your, your investor. You're not going to say you're a failure, but this is the safety valve for him, just in case. So at EIS, um, he will get the initial £3,000 income tax relief. He will also get 40% of the £7,000, which is 2800 so he will actually make a net loss of 42% or 4,200 quid. Under CDIS, he's got the 5,000 pounds and he also gets the loss relief of 40% of the 5,000 pounds remaining after his initial income tax relief. So he's got a net loss of 3,000 pounds. But if he's actually done, um, if he's actually reinvested his capital gain, and let's say he was a, is, uh, you know, is a property guy and he's paying capital gains tax at 28% when he sells his property, his residential letting property, he can roll over 50% of that into it. So that's another 1,400 quid for him. So this is how it comes down to that 16%. So that's the classic condition. So the, if you ever find an investor like, like that, and then, Brilliant. Um, so yeah, so just a bit of small print. Um, those are the restrictions. There's not many, but generally, if you're a tech business, you're a digital company, there's absolutely no problem, provided you are less than those years. So under SIS, it's the three-year limit. Under EIS, the seven-year, and then the kick, 10, 10 years. It's really vitally vital important, that. Um, you can only when you actually make the when you actually issue the shares to the investor, they've got to be identical to the shares that are in issue in the company at that time. So you can't give him any preferential breaks or anything, um, anything where it's you know you we're guaranteed to pay you back out your capital at the end of two years. He's got to be at the same risk as everyone else. Um, he can't pre he cannot already hold non-advantaged shares so that means he can't already have a, a shareholding in the business and then you issue the EIS shares afterwards. One of the really interesting things here is um, under SEIS if you start your own businesses up, if you start your own businesses up you can be a director but provided and you can put your money in at the start and you can get the tax relief yourself, provided you under the 30%. So it's not, it's a thing that people go in and start up on their own, put
probably with, with a group of, of friends who don't actually think just to get down below that 30% they're going to get the full income tax relief for their own investment in there. Okay, so how does the process work? Look, a lot of tech startups, I know they do it them, themselves. It is quite straightforward initially, but when you get the investors on board, especially the North Invest, they're going to be asking a lot more questions and that's when you might need as a firm of accountants, tax advisors, to actually support you and maybe the, the investor as well. Um, what you need to get is advanced assurance. You get a little piece of paper that you show to investors and say, yeah, we are, we are compliant. Um, yeah, so HMRC advanced assurance does not give assurance the investor meets the qualifying conditions. We're really careful about, about, about this, and you've got to be as well. When you're actually, when you're actually raising this, this, this money, um, getting the money from your investor, there's nothing going to be worse than having a massive fallout with that initial investor afterwards if it doesn't work, work out. This, you know, this guy is actually, you have to make sure he is compliant as well. Now, he'll probably got his own, if he's a, a sophisticated investor, he's got his own tax advisors. But one of the things that you just need, need to watch out for is um, if, if they break the rules of association, I've not even spoken about, about, about that yet, but you can only, the association rules means that you can get in, you can't, okay, when you're hitting that 30% maximum, you can't spread it out to say your kids, your wife, or your mum and dad. But bizarrely, you can spread it out to your brother and sister, which is a bit odd. But let's say you're, you married, <laughs> you married one of the investors, you could probably lose your, your, your investment. I've seen it happen. Wow. I've actually seen that actually happen. Um, so if two investors hold 20% uh, each and they strike up uh, a relationship over a piece of tech, they're gonna, <laughs> they're gonna, they're gonna fall foul after the three after the three years because they've breached the conditions. So incredibly exciting, exciting bit of tax relief there, and um, yeah, I've been through it at a rapid pace. I've got a question. Why would any business not be EIS or SEIS? Uh, some of them are restricted, like. I don't think you could be, it's or we could yeah. be. Right. There's, a, there's a risk element to it. You ha it. There has to be a risk that the investor could lose their investment. So right. some businesses, like certainly ones that invest like in property, etc., and banking, they considered not enough for a risk right. that the cash might go down the drain. Risk so that, that, that there has to be a risk um, right. to, to, that the investor might lose the money. If it's a dead cert and you're going to get your money back, mm. the government does. Yeah, it's just, they're not going to play. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're just except we're dealing with um, a, an insure tech company at the moment and if it was a pure insurance company where they just use one broker it's, it's gonna, gonna, gonna fall foul because the insurance falls out of it but if they've got multiple um, if they've got if they work with multiple people within the insurance world for some reason it suddenly, it suddenly becomes a platform a tech pla a platform and it works they are gonna get that EIS and SEIS relief yeah. Uh, what's the due diligence that HMRC do to make sure that um, yeah, you're, you qualify, that you're a genuine company, etc.? Is a bit in both sides of already on an SEIS and yes. With the SEIS, <coughs> I'm yeah. So there's, oh, I can't remember, but there's basically this big long like, checklist, and effectively you basically read through it and tick off against it, and you submit that as a declaration that you meet all requirements. It's, it's things like saying you've not got 30% shares and you've, you, your age of your company, and you've not you're not getting too much. You know you're not getting over the investment limits, and it's so it is very prescribed. It's quite a methodical process, and it is all available on HMLC's website. Um, but it can be quite complex, which is so if you do feel uncomfortable doing it yourself, that's why we would recommend that you do seek professional advice, just to make sure you're not falling foul of anything in the schemes. And do they also see business plans and documents? Yeah, they typically the expect to see sort of business plan, if you've got something, if you've got any kind of draft accounts things that's useful but not, don't really have that, you might have a forecast though. They also want to have an idea of what, they might, they'll ask, they, they like to see the investor details, so it doesn't have to be set in stone, but maybe if you've got one or two investors you think you're going to get lined up, 
um, you would send details, you would send their details to HMRC, so these are the two, you know, two or three people I think I'm getting, and this is what we're going to invest. And it just helps paint the picture. Um, and you effectively send it with all the description about what the business is going to do, what you can do with the cash and everything like that. And you effectively send that all the picture to HMRC and they will say yes or no, basically, that we agree you qualify or we don't agree. And it's all about whether the company qualifies or not. Um, so that's what you're asking, you're asking HMRC, not with the investors. And as Simon's alluded to, the, the investors themselves should take they would have to take their own professional advice normally because um, they should have, they'd normally have an account because they're high net worth individuals and they would get that advice from their own advisor whereas you were just looking at your company. If you, if you went with, with, with North Invest, um, that's normally enough to put on the application that you've actually joined an angel group and you're, you're pitching to an angel group and they need this SEIS. But they normally want to know who the prospective investors are and how much they're, they're, they're going to put in as part of your cash flow. Uh, so we have a question that came through the chat uh, from Paul Phillips. Uh, he asks uh, if um, market research and SEO counts as R&D. Market research. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it depends what is actually being done. Um, Typically, market research is probably not a huge amount of resolution of uncertainties there, so you're not necessarily having, there's not necessarily a huge amount of problems, but to resolve, but I guess it kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're actually creating some sort of software suite behind that to actually do the market research to try and collect information on, say, you, you know, people you're interviewing, then there may be something behind there, but typically market research in a sector that we would see that often, but it's one of those things that without more details of the actual um, sort of development you're considering. Um, it's quite difficult to say, it's difficult to give a okay. definite answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, going back to uh, SEIS, CIS, um, I remember that there was a change uh, in recent years uh, in regulation. Before you used to ask for the status, you know, uh, and now you, so before you, the company used to uh, ask for uh, the documents proving that they were eligible and then go for investors. And if I remember well, now it's the other way around. Was there a change or am I completely off the table? Yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it kind of is a little bit of a chicken and the egg situation because okay. um, your investors will want the confirmation that you actually do qualify, that the company qualifies for the SAS or ES relief. But at the same time, HMRC want a rough idea of the investors mm -hmm. um, when you actually apply for that advance assurance, so it's a little bit of a strange situation to be in. So, so you can't like have the status before you actually have the investors? HMRC might grant it, but it's a good idea to have at least some idea. It doesn't have to be set in stone, you can change it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if it does change in the process. You might, you might, might, have, you might have one dead cert investor, but then you might line up another few more. You know, the, and it's, so it's not the end of the world if you did change, it's just, it, it's, just it's, kind of, it's a bit of a weird situation to be in. Yeah. <laughs> we we see it happen. We see, it can be both both ways. Look, it it's strict. It it is now supposed to be. We would approve where your investments from, but people make their own applications. It's not it's not just something we exclusively do. It's not. You can make your own applications. It's, it, have a go. We, yeah. It's yeah. Somewhere like North Invest will give you help with that, and also the HMRC sort of web page on this are very detailed and will guide you through it, and they are quite good. But if you get stuck, obviously that's when you would want to seek advice, yeah. just to make sure you're not falling foul of anything. Okay. Last question, I think. <laughs> I just want to ask, Jeff, I know you work with a lot of a lot of startups and small businesses. In your view, do you think businesses are taking this up? Do you think awareness is good in the startup market about both of these products? Um, interesting, to, interesting to know that got some start startups today but you, you generally feel we've been trying to commu communicate that out to as many people as possible we've been uh, government being part of the investment readiness and I've been banging on about this <laughs> as part of that as well about SEIS and EIS uh, and all the other parts of the investment readiness as well. So we we'd, we'd try to do our best in the, the well, least situation. I think you do a region. fantastic job, so I was just Thank interested you. in whether you thought, because I think there it's is a large knowledge in market. Really? Okay. I, I don't mean as a result of kind of, you know, 
people not doing what they need to do, but maybe we need to be speaking more about this to, yeah. to start up. So somebody like us at Adventure, for example, should yeah. we be doing a bit more? So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Always happy to work with you guys. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for coming today. Uh, so it's the end of uh, the event and the end of the live stream as well. Um, so for the people who attended the live stream, uh, we uh, have recorded everything. Uh, we will be sending out uh, the link to the recorded event once it's ready. Uh, and uh, we will also share uh, the slides to any, um, any person who requests it specifically, um, uh, if all the speakers uh, obviously uh, agree to it. Thank you again, and uh, hopefully you have enjoyed the event.